The views and opinions heard on this show do not necessarily reflect the views of the host. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Real Spiritual Talk Radio. My breathing had stopped for so long that my heart actually ended up stopping. He saw what I did and said that I was going to die. And then I remember being gone. I wasn't there anymore. I sort of lifted up about six feet above my body. A pinprick of light appeared and came rushing toward me faster than the speed of light. And then this light, all of a sudden it was all completely around me. He says, I am God. Yes, I am real. The main message was loving yourself and loving others. It was clearly shown to me. It was really hard to put into words. It felt like I had been there before. It was just this very personal, impersonal, unconditional love. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back to another edition of Real Spiritual Talk Radio. I am your host, Lamont Gates, once again bringing you the world of faith, metaphysicality, and spirituality. Today, my guest was trained in the philosophy of the here and now, but learned after her experience that so much more awaited. And in turn, her vision of reality has been forever shaped. Let's get it started. Welcome to the broadcast, ladies and gentlemen. Joining me via Skype is near-death experiencer, Dr. Kianush Kasai. Dr. Kasai, welcome to Real Spiritual Talk Radio. Hi, Lamont. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. I thank you very much for coming on. Now, I understand you are in the medical field, correct? Yes, I am. I'm kind of semi-retired. I've shifted to coaching, but yes, my background is uh, healthcare. Great. And you are a researcher whose main focus is on pathology, if I'm not mistaken, also. Yes, that's correct, Lamont. I'm a, I'm a research pathologist from Johns Hopkins Hospital, and uh, I've been doing research as a scientist, working there as a research scientist for a couple of years, and I have some publication in Nature's Magazine. Uh, but I shifted to coaching, you know, as as we are going to talk about that later in life, you know, gradually, and I became certified in emotional intelligence and a spiritual intelligence coach. I'm currently also working as a fellow at the Institute of Coaching, which is a Harvard affiliated, and I'm serving in the IOC REI Council, Council, the Race, Equity, and Inclusion. And as you know, I'm the founder of the My Conscious Coaching Group, which is a nonprofit 501c3. That's wonderful to hear because many times near-death experiencers already have preconceived religious notions before their near-death experience. So it will be great to hear from someone who's trained from a scientific philosophy. But uh, before we get into your account, let's go backwards. Uh, Give us a little historical context. What was it like growing up as a child, for example, hearing about subjects of religion and or spirituality? What was it you were taught in this particular area? That's an interesting question, Lamont. Yeah, I, I was born in a family, both teachers, and uh, they, were, they were more culturally and traditionally religious, not strictly religious. And my parents were both in education, and my father was an open-minded biologist, also a scientist, you know, and teaching in a well-recognized community college. And my mother also was an elementary school teacher. The value that I've been raised with uh, as I remember, was God and goodness and the honesty and humanity. So the kind of spirituality that I, I have been raised with well, has, been a, has been a horizontal spirituality more than a vertical one, just doing good to people and to be helpful with them, be considerate to the poor and the sick and um, take care of those that are in a lower socioeconomic status, even while we weren't rich ourselves. And I always remember that my mother was helping with the food banks through the school, gathering clothes or, you know, gathering money for the low incomes. And my father was doing free tutoring, you know, for his talented students who were struggling in life. 
So spirituality for me was more kind of humanity. Yeah? That was my religious, my training was in that. Uh, to be a good human and uh, to do what is right for people and for myself, you know, as a human being. And uh, but, but I also have religious memories, especially with my grandparents. They were more, you know, uh, religious and with my grandmothers, especially and my aunt while they were praying. And uh, my mom sometimes were taking me to the mosque, you know, or the funeral in the cemeteries to visit her grandparents, you know, graves. And that was actually, when I go back in time, the first time that I was asking myself the question, what is God, who is God, and what is religious? So as a little girl, you know, that's the memory that I have. So overall, in brief, humanity was my religious being raised up in a family, you know, both parents, teacher. Sounds like you were adopting a humanist philosophy uh, very early in life now. You are originally from Iran, correct? Where Islam is the predominant religion. Yes, it is. And uh, as I said, you know, my, my family are traditionally and culturally, they were um, uh, religious. But I don't remember my father never forced me to, to practice, you know, just the, the Islam's, you know, practices or the prayers. So he was more, you know, feeding me with, with the, you know, the subject of the humanity and waiting for me to be awakening, you know, to what I want and how I see the religious and how I discover the God and what I choose for myself that is best for, my, for me. So let's go into your near-death experience. Tell us how it actually occurred. Yeah, I remember I was in, um, in 2006, actually. I was a uh, fellow, pathology fellow at Johns Hopkins Hospital, and I found out that I have this... Uh, 20 centimeter annoyingly fast growing mass in the size of the cantaloupe in my abdomen. So we did the ultrasound and discovered all of these. And uh, you can imagine the anxiety and the stress that I came with it. So we just, since my husband also was a physician and pathologist and we knew good surgeons, and at the same time, you know, we were in a transition moving from this place to that place, we managed to have the surgery immediately. Uh, and that was important because the, the mass has been pressuring my inter- internal organs and I needed to have the surgery ASAP. Uh, I remember the day after surgery, the nurses came to my room and they want to take me to the, to the uh, bathroom, changing my dressing, give me a shower. And I remember I just had been walking before too. So I got out of, of the bed. And started, you know, taking the steps toward the bathroom. And my blood pressure also wasn't low or something. They just measured it, you know, a few minutes before. And while I was looking at the bathroom door to hold my hand, you know, to reach out, suddenly I felt that uh, I'm flying and being sucked through a, through a tunnel, through a dark tunnel very fast, you know, just like in milliseconds of time. And uh, it, um, it, it wasn't the bathroom anymore. I reached to an open, wide, infinite space and standing, seeing myself standing on the edge and border of a new periphery that um, being surrounded by a loving, understanding, cuddling, warm energy that, um, that, and light that is, uh, I cannot find you know, any, any appropriate word to put it that how that energy and that feeling was. And they were waiting for me. And I arrived there and I stood on the edge on that border. And I was waiting for the permission to take one more extra step and get to the other side and be become one and be solved and dissolved in that being. And I really was, you know, uh, felt in peace and in, in a love, in a different kind of love, you know, that, as I said, um, I can't express it in words. They were all just feelings. And uh, uh, at the same time, I, I wanted to take that extra step, but I couldn't. So I was just like my feet were nailed to the ground and waiting for the permission to move forward. Something had stopped me while I'm still being pulled and attracted toward that other side and that energy. 
And that living light at the same time was whispering to my ear all the answers and the secrets that this universe, you know, had. It was whispering in my ear all the questions that I had in life, even the questions that I didn't have (laughs) were answered. So all the secret of this universe were being told to me, told to me at this at that moment. And I was absorbing it all while I'm being pulled to that light. And still I wasn't able to move. And uh, anything you know that I needed to know in my life and even uh, from the universe, I knew it then. And that that kind of understanding for me, never, I never had experienced it before. And the interesting part is just there was no time and there was no language there also. So the conversation that that, that source, that energy, that divine, you want to call it God, so just had with me, uh, the conversation was without any word, without uh, just like a telepathic conversation. And uh, it was from heart to heart, like mind to mind, or maybe better you say it from consciousness to consciousness. So, and I felt that I am one with that, with that consciousness. I am one with that being, and I have come from there, and that's where I belong to. And I was temporarily back where, where I was. We call it Earth, and now I'm arriving to to where I where I needed to be and where where I have come from. And uh, as that part of that giant consciousness, you know, uh, that energy and that healing and that peace and that loving, you know, light was filling me up. And uh, uh, at the same time, I I started to sensing and paying attention to the surrounding of that light. And uh, I saw that I'm hearing other noises of that, like the celebration and... uh, some familiar, you know, uh, being. And uh, some of them I knew that they were like my grand grandparents. Some of them I, I had uh, known them that who are they? I wasn't seeing them, but I knew that it's them. So it's just like all my ancestors back to the beginning were and celebrating my arrivals. And again, that magnetic attraction of that loving energy still was growing and growing and continuing getting bigger and bigger. And at the same time, I heard another noise. And that one was really familiar because it was my husband's voice. And uh, he was calling me, Kianush, Kianush. And that was really strange for me because he really interrupted, you know, he interrupted, you know, that party for me. And I started to hear him more louder and louder the more he was calling me. And I got curious about it. What does he want? And uh, then while I was standing there and uh, I just uh, paused uh, or maybe asked permission from from the source or uh, that being worried with myself. And the, the moment that I got worried, I started to think that maybe he's calling me and needed something about my son, which I, he was eight years old at that time. And uh, so I, and I said, dutiful, you know, wife and mother, you know, I, I, that was always, you know, the priority, but I didn't want to leave there. So it's a kind of asking again in a nonverbal language from the source, from that divine that, you know, can I just have one second, you know, to see what he wants and what is this calling about? And they were telling me, you are, you are allowed to go and we are waiting for you. And while I was just uh, deciding, you know, to come back, still I couldn't turn my face from that loving energy. And I was just keep asking them, you know, like a promise, just uh, save my seat. I'm going to come back in a second. Just give me a minute, you know, let's see what he wants. And I'm going to come back, you know, again. And while I didn't want to leave there, but I knew that I needed back there, back, you know, behind in me. And uh, so while I turned my face toward my husband's voice that was calling me, and I felt again I'm being sucked in that tunnel, you know, and just again in a fraction of no time, I saw myself, I opened my eyes, I was on the mm, floor of the hospital, in the bathroom floor, and the nurses and the CPR team were there and my husband, you know, with his 
big, wide open eyes, you know, scared, you know, I still kept looking, calling my name. And, uh, and I was just, you know, uh, surprised at what happened to me. And, uh, still was on the floor, but the nurses came, they, they were ready for the CPR, but then they just decided not to continue because I came into it. And that was my experience just there. Uh, that was probably incredibly overwhelming for you, especially being a doctor trained in science. Two follow-up questions I have um, based on your account. As a medical physician, you have probably only been trained to think in physical and materialistic terms. But what were your thoughts coming back from this particular experience? No, actually, yeah, it, it, it changed uh, my whole perception, I mean, not mentioning that it changed my whole life. So that that was my point, you know, the shift that I had gradually and starting, you know, withdrawing from the medical research, starting to go into yoga and meditation and, you know, shifted to the coaching. And I was curious about it. I was curious. I was confused. So, But I knew it's, it was real. I knew it was real and uh, I, I wasn't telling anyone. I even didn't tell my husband for a, one or two, a couple of weeks after, you know, because I was just keep reviewing with myself. And I was, to be honest with you, I was kind of upset that I'm back and just mad of my husband. Why did you call me? So just, uh, I wanted still to be there, just go and pick, you know, in that loving place that I belong to. And now, you know, I'm back here and I don't know when I, when I can go there. But then again, I, somehow I was happy because I had responsibility then who would have taken care of my son. So, and uh, I think that, that that conflict, that living between these two lives for a long time, you know, was my kind of struggling. And because I wanted to be there, but I was on the air. But at the same time, I came back with many gifted and skills, you know, and uh, I had this, you know, seeing these co colors in a different way. So I was experiencing life in a different way. And as you said, you know, as a physician, as, as a scientist, you know, I knew that that was an evasophical syncope because, you know, I had a vagal syncope before that wasn't that. And I knew that it wasn't the dreaming too, because, uh, it was so vivid and live, you know, it was living in me and with me. And uh, the memory that still I have from that experience is as vivid as I have from my parents. So if it was a dream, it would have been deluded and, you know, being forgotten, especially that I'm aging and I'm forgetting so many things. But, <laughs> but that, that, you know, that experience, you know, still is live and vivid with me. And I just have to close my eyes and see myself standing in that on that edge and all the you know the feeling and the you know the uh, uh, loving uh, peace is coming to me and actually that's my getaway when I'm in a difficult most stressful situation to center myself and uh, yeah I agree with you it was difficult it was I was curious but there's also you know uh, uh, for me, more confirmation also with that spiritual training that I have been raised with as a you know little girl, you know, in a in a in a traditional family that they believed in God and they they believe in spirituality. My second follow up question: You described receiving all the answers to your questions and non questions. Do you recall any of these answers you received? I, I wish I had, and it's kind of yes and no. It's just like, you know, when you see a movie and then you forget it and then you see it again and you remember, oh, I've seen this movie. So it's just kind of, for me, is that kind of knowing, you know, and and, and feeling. So, uh, and, and I, I have some kind of, you know, I don't want to call it six, seven or eight cents, whatever it is. I have some kind of... Uh, gifted as foreseeing, you know, things that are coming. And again, it's just like clicking, you know, feeling in the, you know, in the blank. So I feel it, I, I sense it, I know things. I know things without even, I, I know why I know this stuff. For example, my husband is losing his glasses or I just, you know, uh, looking for a solution for something, you know, and things happen to me and I just tell him, look there and then he goes and he finds his glasses or I'm just 
looking for something on the internet and I just uh, centered myself, see myself, you know, and ask uh, the guidance and I find my answers, you know, and my paths, you know, to the right direction. So things coming to me and I know them without knowing them, especially with the people, you know, I, I see, I see true people. I see the, the souls. I see the, the pains that, you know, that there are struggles with it. And I, I don't know, this is a good thing or it's a bad thing. So, but I also has been an advantage for me in my coaching practices. So that I was being able to connect better with my clients and to understand them, to be more present for them. So it sounds like you certainly did return with some sort of precognition or sixth sense, which is common in many near-death experiences. Going back to you saying you did not want to initially tell anyone about your experience, uh, except your husband, but as a physician, did you ever go out on a limb and discuss this with any of your physician counterparts? Uh, actually, not for a long time until my husband, you know, that was interesting. He wasn't even uh, believing me at the beginning, you know, as a scientist and you know, a pathologist. He had to see everything under microscope to believe that what he is saying. And I don't blame him for that. And justifying, you know, with all the science, you know, possibility of it. Uh, but then one time I was just keep telling him, you know, this happened, that happened, that happened. And one time he called me from his way to work and he said, I'm hearing something in the NPR. It's about uh, Barbara Bradley books about the fingerprints of God. And she's talking about the same thing that you have been keep telling me every day, every week in the past couple of months. So maybe you want to read this book. And I just, you know, just I, I love him even more for just telling me that now that I'm looking back. That book really opened me to the world of research. So I found out that I, I, that wasn't only me because I was scared to tell people and they think I'm crazy or I've lost my mind. But when I read, his, read her book, I found about that her research, you know, for 10 years that she has been doing this research on the NDEs and the years and the spiritual awakenings. And I, as a research scientist, I started to do my own research. And then from there... Uh, I found out, you know, the uh, IANS, International Association of near Death Studies, which right now, you know, I'm a member in it. I'm also, as a facilitator, actually, I have an event on March 28th that I'm facilitating a group on IANS, you know, for the end of the year. And I haven't, I have kept my, you know, my communication, I mean, the meetings and being in touch with them since back then. But to give you the answer, short answer to your question, no, I didn't for, for many, many years. But then eventually, I, then I did my research and I found out, you know, that there are like 40,000 people like me, you know, around the globe have had this experience. I started writing my book. I wrote my chapter books, Beautiful Scars. And I thought that's the time, you know, that I tell the world, you know, and I made the website and... Uh, I also founded the nonprofit Conscious Coaching with, with initiatives in coaching and healthcare and education eventually after the book was published. So how were you received by your medical counterparts after they learned of your account? Yes, I mean, different, uh, different reactions. So as I said, education, you know, is one of you know, the, the initiatives that we have, you know, in our nonprofit is education, coaching in education. So the physician who have been reading and uh, hearing about the research, they felt more receptive. And uh, it just depend, depended on what was the mindset. But uh, it, for sure, it made them all curious and it made them, you know, and it was inspirational for all of them. And I, I have a friend that she even doesn't believe, you know, she's a kind of like an atheist or just doesn't believe in any religious. But she read my book and she said, when I was reading it, I was I was crying and it was so inspirational and uplifting for me. And whatever is going on to in after love, you made me to think about how should I live my life here in this earth? And for me, that was rewarding, you know, just awakening one human soul to the to the gifts and tools that they have in life. For me, that was good enough. And that's going to actually move into my next question. Is there any advice or encouraging words in general you'd like others to know? 
As you mentioned about your friend, for example, many near-death experiencers come back seeing and living life differently. They discover purpose, etc. What would you share with others on this particular topic? Yes, I mean, this life, now, as, as I came back to it, I felt that it's a gift. Uh, this, this is a school of life. This is a school of learning. And it's a valuable gift that we have to live it on a, on a daily basis. That love, love is the key. So it's the love that I mean is is the love that, like uh, as Buddha says, love is a bird that uh, has two wings, compassion and wisdom. If one of the wings is broken, the bird cannot fly. So that kind of love, the the loving wisdom kind, uh, hash, compassionate love is the key. And uh, I'm, I'm trying, you know, that that's my work, that's my learning to embody that love love in my daily living in my coaching practices even though i'm working you know with the leaders and the ceos you know and uh, very serious you know uh, business people i'm trying to embody and awakening them to that kind of love as a leader and i always says live your life the way that when you want to die die happy so it's just that and hear your calling and you don't have to to be dead to learn how to live and uh, listen to universe, see what what universe is whispering to your ear as you're calling. What's your calling? Why are you in this earth? What's your mission? And uh, who you want to be, so you can die happy and not only live happy, you can also die happy. And uh, the other thing is just that we are all one. We are all one soul. While I was standing there, I found out that uh, we are soul particles. So you and I are not separate. We eventually become one as we have been one. And let's live this life just like, like that, that as, as a one being. We are one consciousness. And uh, that, that kind of you know, uh, insight and awakening, it helps the transition and transformation to transcending to the higher level of consciousness. So ultimately, it sounds to me that your near-death experience mirrored what you and your parents were already doing with the charitable deeds and caring for the less fortunate, would you say? Exactly. You put it very beautifully, you know, circle back again to where I came from. So exactly just like all religion, all the religions are pointing to one, one destination. It's just a different path. So all of us that following you know the spirituality and humanity or different religions we are going to one place but we are using the different path in different way so where can the audience find you and your organization and your work in regards to spiritual counseling yeah i don't call it a spiritual counseling i call it you know coaching with the focus on emotional intelligence and spiritual intelligence which i'm certified in it and uh, I have a website, www.myconscious.org. And my email is coach, C-O-A-C-H, at myconscious.org. We are also on social media, which uh, I would love that people follow us. We are on Instagram, and we are on LinkedIn, and we are on Facebook, My Conscious Coaching Group, and also Twitter, too. So please follow us, and uh, we will be in touch. Well, Dr. Kasai, I want to thank you for coming on Real Spiritual Talk Radio. Your account was very enlightening and encouraging. Thank you very much. I also appreciate you and I'm grateful for you doing this wonderful work, you know, all for free for the public to raise the education and awareness and the needed experience. And uh, God bless you and wish you well and the best. I thank you and same to you. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Kianush Kasai. And I want to thank you all for tuning in to another edition of Real Spiritual Talk Radio. Please catch me on my Facebook page, Real Spiritual Talk Radio. There you will find past shows and other relevant information as they pertain to near-death experiences. Once again, I hope you have all been spiritually enlightened, as I always am when I am listening to these accounts. And with that said, I am your host, Lamont Gates, and this is... Real Spiritual Talk Radio, now signing off.